Well, first I want to say thank you for everybody that, that came out tonight. I know the weather has turned really bad, and, and unfortunately this is the second year we've done this and it poured down rain, so maybe we need to do this more often so we can create rain for Texas. But, uh, but thank you all for, for braving the weather, and I hope you enjoy this this evening. Uh, for those of you all that are not familiar with it, uh, we actually have a Sherlock Holmes Society here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and it's called the Crew of the Bark Lone Star, which was actually one of the ships that was uh, named in one of the 60 stories of Sherlock Holmes, and so we thought that was an appropriate name for ours. And so uh, we take voyages every month, uh, and so if you are interested in it, if you'll see anybody that has a Sherlock shirt on, we can tell you about our meetings. We meet once a month at the La Madeline Restaurant, up at the Tollway and Beltline Road um, on one, at 1 o'clock on the first Sunday of each month. And we cover one of the stories, and we take a quiz, and we try to have a presentation each month. And so we have a lot of fun with it. Uh, we have about 140 members in our society, and about 20 show up for each meeting. So we, we really have a good time with it. So uh, a couple other things. As Tom mentioned, if you do want to bring something in to drink, you're welcome to do so. We have iced tea and water out back. And we also have cookies, so Sherlockian cookies, I believe. So if you want to eat cookies, you're welcome to that. Also up here in the front, we have a lot of books uh, that have been donated to us and, and or you know, people have brought them to us. Those are all free. So if you, would like a, if you need a Sherlockian book, there's some of the complete stories and some pastiches and some, a couple of biographies of Doyle and everything else. Feel free to grab one or two books. I don't want to see people with arm loads, but uh, you are welcome to grab a couple of books. And we have some brochures, and we say have some handouts up here too. So we have lots of things for free with you. We have a bracelet if you want one. It uh, says, what would Sherlock Holmes do, which is always good to have. Uh, we, the original one said, you know, WWSD. And unfortunately, we made it in black, and everybody thought that meant what would Satan do. And so we were... People thought we were a cult, so the new ones, we added the H to it, so that it would not confuse people with that. But, but we have the bracelets for free, and we also have business cards up here of the society. And one of the main things that I would like to say also is that we have a wonderful website. So it's on the business cards and, and on our, uh, our bookmarks up here. It's dfw-sherlock.org, and we have all sorts of information on there about our society and about Sherlock, Sherlock Holmes in general. So... Uh, feel free to come and look at that. So with that, what I would like to do is, is turn it over to our first presenter. We have four presenters tonight, and the first one is Lise Sherwood Fabre. Uh, she is one of our members and has been for a few years now, and, and she is a published writer. She has uh, written a uh, Sherlock Holmes book and, and quite a few other things. And, and if you get our monthly newsletter, you will see that she writes an article for us every month on uh, something about the Victorian times and does wonderful research on it. And so she is going to talk to you about the bad girls of Sherlock Holmes, uh, the villainesses of Sherlock Holmes. So I will turn it over to Lise. Well, first of all, good evening. Oh, come on. This is Texas. Good evening. All right, that's a little better. Uh, again, I'm Lisa Sherwood Fabre, and I am so pleased to be part uh, of this symposium tonight and the examination of the women in Sherlock Holmes. And as Steve mentioned, I'm going to focus on the evil women, the villainesses of, that Sherlock Holmes pursued in, his can, in the canon. The canon is our way of referring to the 60 stories that were written by Arthur Conan Doyle. And to get started, I want to make sure we all have a basic understanding of what it was, what, uh, the relationship of men and women during the Victorian times. So the first thing I want to note is that men and women were divided into what they called separate spheres. That is, the men worked outside the home, the women had responsibility for the home and the children. And sometimes they only saw each other at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day, uh, when the men came home from work. And the reason the women were in charge of the home and family was because they were considered physically inferior, but morally superior to men. They, and however, this moral superiority was rather continuous. That is, it didn't take much to, for them to fall. And so they had to be protected. One of the ways they were protected was that they were never allowed to be alone with a man 
that was not their husband or a family member. They were always chaperoned until they got married. And it didn't take much for a scandal to cause a woman, if she was single or engaged, she might not, she, the man could um, call off the engagement if any kind of scandal happened. Or if she was already married, it could lead to divorce, or it could have an effect on the husband's standing in the community. So it's very important to keep your, um, keep your moral superiority. And we need to keep this in mind as we look at some of the, villain, the motives behind the villainesses. So, but despite this superior, moral superiority, as I mentioned, there was a, quite a, uh, it was tenuous. And it wasn't, it didn't, and if we take a look at the statistics, the criminal statistics, and I just have an example from 1856, um, about more than a third of the arrests in 1856 in London were for, uh, were of women. However, and, but the difference between perhaps what you might find among men is most of these um, crimes, most of the things they were, um, arrested for were for either prostitution or other forms of victimless crimes such as um, uh, drunkenness or drunken disorderly or vagrancy. So the, the crimes were not, for the most part, major crimes. Of course, Sherlock Holmes wouldn't have been interested in a case of vagrancy. What he would be interested in is something much more evil, and that's what the, the women that we're looking at tonight. There were, um, as I mentioned, there are 60 stories in the canon. Of those, 15 stories include a villainous. And I'm not going to go through each one of these. We'd both be bored. Um, but I can give you a little bit more about their crimes. We had nine murders. We had two thefts one black male, one case of bigamy, one kidnapping, and one assault. But just as important as what they, what they did is the reason of why they did it. Remember, we're talking about motive. And that is where we really find some very interesting things going on. To classify the motives, to look at the why, I used Cammie, Tammy Cowden's classifications or descriptions of the villain or villainess's arch archetypes. This is something um, that she, she identified eight villains and eight villainesses, the archetypes. And this term was something that was developed by Carl Jung to describe, uh, to use a sort of shorthand for universal characteristics and characters that everybody would recognize because we have shared memories and experiences. When we start talking about villainesses, the archetypes provide, um, identify their most basic instincts. That is what the m woman thinks, what she feels, what drives her, in other words, the motive, and how she will reach her goals. And so when we talk about the term villain in these stories, we have to remember it's kind of used rather loosely. Basically, it's the antagonist. If, you've, if you remember your English and your studying of, short, of stories and plot and everything, you have a hero and you have a, or a main character and the antagonist. And in the Sherlockian uh, mysteries, there's somebody who's committed a crime and he's got to figure out who it is. That's your antagonist. And, it's, and the major thing is with these archetypes is that it's not what they did, but rather why they did it, that the motive that, ca that um, causes their classification or how they're defined. And I'm not going to go, uh, I know this is really detailed, but basically we have, as I mentioned, eight archetypes. We have the bitch who uh, their, uh, their motive is, is power. They want power. You have the black widow who's similar to the bitch, except that she's not so much interested in power as she is with the trappings of power. You have the backstabber. This is somebody who is trying to maintain the status quo of, of the situation that they're in. And they'll do anything to manipulate people in such a way as to maintain their, their status quo. You have the lunatic, 
and that is somebody who has their own logic that makes no sense to anybody else, but they understand and they know, they've defined their world a certain way, and sometimes you just get sucked into that regardless. You have the parasite. This is what we might call the accomplice. That is, they might not be the one in charge or decide to do a crime, but they'll go along if it means that they're going to get what they want out of it. You have the schemer. This is somebody who's uh, really interested in showing off their smarts, uh, and they'll manipulate things just to, in, just to show how smart and how they can run over everybody else. You have the fanatic, that is somebody who feels that their, the means justifies the end. They have something that they want to achieve, and however they can do it, they will do so. And you have the matriarch, and this is somebody who's concerned about maintaining or keeping their family or their young intact. And they'll do whatever to maintain that. So when we look at the archetypes this way, what we find is we have five parasites, that is five people who were um, accomplices to somebody else. We have five fanatics, again, remembering that what they are concerned with is the end, do, achieving their, the end however they want. For the most part, uh, a lot of times, this is revenge in these stories. We have two schemers, of course, we, um, Irene Adler, in the most famous villainess in, from the canon. Um, we also have one backstabber. We have one lunatic and one black widow. The two that are missing are the, the bitch and the matriarch. So we have all these women that fall into these categories. And what happened to them? They've committed a crime. What happens? Six, in six cases, nothing. Nothing happened to them. In four cases, they managed to escape. Um, in two cases, they were uh, made restitution for their crime. In two, they committed suicide, and only one was actually prosecuted and sentenced to the jail. And so basically, the first 10, they got away with it in some fashion. And we had two others that managed to avoid a pers uh, prosecution because they made, made restitution. So let's see how they got away with it. Well, in terms of the ones that disappeared or escaped, uh, we have um, Irene Adler, of course. She, gets, she marries and she leaves town with her husband, but she protects herself by keeping a photo that, everybody, uh, that would cause scandal to somebody else. We have Rachel Howells, who um, helped her former lover find a treasure, and once they found it in this hole, she, uh, she drops the uh, cover back on the hole with him in it and runs away. She has no interest in the treasure. The treasure gets tossed away, but she does get, she uh, manages to escape and leave this guy to suffocate. We have Miss, Mrs. Henry Peters, and she escapes with her husband after they um, kidnap the lady Car Carfax, and actually she's about to be, she almost dies. She's been chloroformed. And while everybody's trying to revive poor, Mrs. Car uh, to poor lady Carfax, she and her husband disappear. And um, so then we have the uh, justifiable. Uh, these were viewed as the, the crime was considered justifiable, in, at least in um, Sherlock Holmes' eyes. There is a widow, we don't, never know her name, who murders a blackmailer because he had caused her death, the death of her husband. And, she's, um, and Sherlock Holmes never uh, shares the identity of the killer uh, because he says, my sympathies are with the criminals. Then we have Amelia Luca. She and her husband uh, are part of a, a plan to murder somebody who what we would call them a, he, uh, we would call him a mafia character. He was responsible for more than 50 deaths. And when Sherlock Holmes is able to draw this woman out, um, Inspector Grigson says that if he finds out that the story is true, what this woman tells, nobody's going to prosecute her or her husband because what they did was rid the world of a murderer. And so they did a good deed. 
and so their, their crime was also justifiable. We have Lady Hilda, who steals a diplomatic dispatch from her husband because she's, trying, because she's being blackmailed and she's trying to protect her reputation and in some ways that of her husband because she'll, she's protecting her reputation. And she probably, who knows would have, what would have happened except that the secret wife of the blackmailer shows up when she's in the room with him. The, the wife shoots the man and so they return the dispatch and Sherlock Holmes notes that we all have our diplomatic secrets. So he never reveals either the name of the, who killed the blackmailer or how the dispatch suddenly got back into that little box. We have three people that make amends. Hattie Duran was the bigamist. She didn't know her husband was still around. She gets married, he shows up at the church um, and she goes through with the ceremony but disappears afterwards and Sherlock tra tracks her down and convinces her to at least go back and apologize to the man. So she makes amends there. Uh, Beryl Stapleton assisted her husband in earlier murders but when she finds out about the next murder he has planned, she tries to stop him and actually assist Sherlock and, and Watson at that, um, uh, to stop the, the next murder. Isadora Klein tries to steal a manuscript that was written by a young man after he commits, just before he commits suicide when she spur after she spurns him. And uh, Sherlock Holmes makes her pay for a round-the-world trip for his mother as a payment for her, his murder, I mean his suicide. Um, and then we have three cases where punishment is enough for the person. Mary Holder um, helped her, husband, her lover steal a crown, and then, um, yeah, there's some sort of, an <laughs> an, uh, is there a tornado coming? Do we need to, huh? Oh, okay. All right, well, everybody get your hip boots on. Um, so Mary Holder helps her lover steal a crown, and, but when the theft is stopped, she runs off with him, and we all know that this guy, she's, the guy that she ran off with is not a good person, and uh, somebody concludes, whatever her sins are, they will soon receive more than sufficient punishment. She's, just, she's stuck with this guy that she's run off with, and it's not gonna be good in the end. Sarah Cushing manipulates the murder of her sister after the, the sister marries the man that uh, Sarah had wanted to marry and uh, causes, manipulates the murder of both the sister uh, and the sister's lover. And she's um, struck with what they call brain, what was referred to as brain fever. So she becomes very sick. Eugenia Ponder is maimed for life by a, a lion after she and her lover free the lion as part of a plot to have her husband, um, part of a plot for murdering her husband. And after she gets, after she's uh, disfigured, um, her lover leaves her. So you can see how they, some of them managed to get away with murder, but not all the time did they go unpunished. And so then we look at the three where things didn't, didn't turn out so well. Uh, we had two suicides. One of them uh, was uh, uh, intentional in that she's caught and she commits suicide. Um, Mrs. Neil Gibson in The Problem of Thorbridge, what she did was she committed suicide but manipulated it in such a way to look like it, it was a murder and implicated somebody else. This is, she's by the way, the lunatic. Um, and then we have poor Kitty Winter. She is the one woman that is prosecuted and sent to jail because she threw acid on a, on a, a not a nice man. So for the last, and however, if you notice, all three of these were, uh, were seeking revenge, but as I mentioned, Mrs. Gibson was uh, a lunatic because her efforts were beyond rational thought. So why, did, why was um, Kitty Winter so different from all the others? Why did, how did she wind up being the one that was pro prosecuted? Basically, it goes back to um, the villainous's comportment as well as her motives. It was 
uh, it was not beyond Sherlock Holmes to recognize that some crimes are justifiable. Even he would break and enter into a house if he needed to steal evidence at times. But, the, but throughout, you have, the woman has to maintain her dignity. Remember this moral superiority of women and has to act accordingly for Sherlock Holmes to respond also as a gentleman. In addition, the woman's fate has to be considered. Uh, when we look at, uh, beyond Eugenia Ponder and Sarah Cushing and Mary Holder, which I've all also mentioned, I already mentioned, Beryl Stapleton is left a widow. Rachel Howells loses her love interest. Lady Hilda has to live with the knowledge that she betrayed her husband. So all six of these have to live with the consequences of their actions as well. So when we take a look at the archetypes that uh, Tammy Cowden developed, it allows us to classify the, the villains' motives. But in addition to motive, we have to consider the lady, whether or not the lady had proper behavior as well as the consequences of her actions because this is how, what helps determine whether Sherlock Holmes um, um, how helps Sherlock Holmes determine their final fate. And so I'm now open for questions. Uh, you pointed out that the one person who actually faced judicial punishment was Kitty Winter, mm -hmm. who I think is the one person who is quite identifiable with the lower classes. Yeah. Is that a, a comment on justice in the Victorian era? I, I would say that's part of it, yeah. She also didn't act as a lady. You don't th a lady would never throw acid on somebody. <laughs> you, know? you know, she might, she would faint or in some other way, but she would not, she would not physically attack somebody. She, lo she lost her moral superiority. Questions, comments, protest? I have two. Well, thank you. I have two questions. Oh, yeah. Did any of the men commit suicide? I didn't study the men. Okay. Um, you know, there's another 45 stories. And <laughs> the next question is. Hold on. Let me. Yeah, that's true. I think you could probably make the argument that Mr. Stapleton did at the end of the Hound of the Baskervilles because he had already said that. Very few people could run out there, and he ran out there into the mire and at dark, you know, knowing that he could not make it across it safely. So I think he probably took the easy way out. I have another question. Mm -hmm. A lot of times in, uh, I've read psychological analysis of crimes, you can have a person that would not commit a murder a person that would not commit a murder, but when they get together, their psychologies evoke each other to commit a murder. D do you see any of this pairing going on? Uh, only the way that the, in, in the archetypes, what that shows is that would be the parasite. The parasite would not necessarily commit a, murder, a crime on their own, but they're quite willing to go along with somebody else. The, one of the most classic examples is Bonnie of Bonnie and Clyde. You know, she might not have done some of the stuff that went on if, it, if she hadn't had Clyde with her. Absolutely. I've read accounts that people knew her as a little girl, said she was the sweetest thing, got with him, and he, she's a killer. Yeah. All right. Next on the agenda, we're going to have Cindy Brown. And quite honestly, I don't have to say a whole lot for, about her because I worked with her for 25 years at EPA together. So... She is one of the, one, I consider one of my best friends, but uh, she has been the secretary of our society for the last three years, along with Brenda, um, and helps keep up with everything and does a wonderful job. And so she is going to be speaking about the modern Irene Adlers and how they fit in with the original one. So, Cindy? Okay. All right. If there is a character from the Sherlockian canon who is really ripe for translation from the pages of Conan Doyle onto the screen, it would certainly be Irene Adler, without a doubt. She's beautiful, resourceful, courageous, strong-willed, impulsive, 
compassionate. This is a woman after my own heart. She's got it all going on. There are a few writers and actresses who would not relish the role with such qualities. They would love to do that. However, when it came to translating Doyle's work from the written word to the small screen and the large screen and the stage, many women, including Irene Adler, many women of that day were cast aside for the more important male character, especially, especially the ever nasty um, Professor Moriarty. Irene's presence reverberates strongly, and the dramatic potential of her role as the woman in Holmes' life was destined to influence many Sherlockian stage works. Despite her brief appearance in Scandal in Bohemia, she remains one of the most talked about Doyle characters, in large part because she evokes in Holmes exactly the qualities that all readers can sympathize with, attraction, admiration, even love. In Scandal in Bohemia, Dr. Watson states that love is a quality that Sherlock Holmes could never feel, could never have. Yet Watson seems to miss the clues nestled in his very own narrative. In that very same story, Sherlock Holmes tells Dr. Watson, you see, but you do not observe. Many of the Adler characters were glamorous and boldly unconventional. It is important to point out that while in some circles these women were thought of as kept women of the stage or the grand horizontals, in other circles they were considered liberated women who simply rejected the social mores of their time. Miss Adler states at the end of Scandal in Bohemia that she often dresses in male costumes and she, because of the, uh, she, likes to, she likes to do this because it gives her uh, freedom because of the advantage it, it gives her to have that freedom and to express herself. Some may believe that this alludes to her, uh, her operatic roles and, and wearing trousers and, and dressing up as men, but it really is consistent with the view that she is just a woman ahead of her time. A series of mystery novels written by our very own Carol Nelson Douglas from right here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area features Irene Adler as the protagonist and the sleuth doing, and doing a chron 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 chronicle of her life shortly before as in the novel Goodnight Mr. Holmes and after her notable encounter with Sherlock Holmes. And, and her novels, Carol Nelson Douglas's novels, all feature Irene Adler as the main character and Holmes as the supporting character. So this is a really fun way to look at it. Let's look at some of the ladies who have, uh, who have been Irene Adler through the years. This is a picture from the 1916 stage play, Sherlock Holmes, and Alice Falconer played Irene Adler. This is the, the very famous William Gillette play. And she played also, she also played Irene Adler in 1922 versus um, um, John Barrymore as, as Sherlock Holmes. And, and in that one, Sherlock Holmes literally falls into her arms. And there is a, a, a lot of uh, a love and affection in both of the plays. This is a picture from the 1965 Broadway play called Baker Street. And this Irene Adler is Inga Swenson. And she's a beautiful uh, American-born stage and screen actress who had just been nominated for her, uh, she'd just been nominated for a Tony Award for her uh, performance in 110 in the Shade. And she was also no nominated for a Tony in this uh, play of Baker Street. It's a musical. Uh, the play, w the musical was very well accepted by Sherlockians and critics, but it was not a big success at the, at the box office. And she did not win either Tony Award, by the way. This is probably one many of you will recognize. This is Sherlock Holmes' smarter brother. Uh, this is in 1975. Madeline Kahn and um, our very own beloved Gene Wilder. I say that because people, you know, he played Sherlock Holmes. You've got to love him. This was sort of a madcap movie where it, it's a zany, lowbrow comedy. It was written, directed, and starred in by Gene Wilder. And, and the interesting thing about Madeline Kahn, she was sort of like an inverse Irene Adler in this. She's neither elegant nor demure. She's a bad liar. She's raucous. She's sexually suggestive. She's a music hall singer. Maybe this was Irene Adler in her younger days. Who knows? This is a 1976 film called Sherlock Holmes in New York, and it starred Charlotte Rambling as Irene Adler opposite Roger Moore. She helps Holmes and Watson solve a bank robbery organized by Holmes' nemesis, Professor Moriarty, after he takes her son uh, hostage to prevent Holmes from, to prevent Holmes from uh, investigating the case. 
Holmes and Watson, of course, rescue the boy with the final conversation between Holmes and Irene Adler at the conclusion of the case, implying that Holmes is really the boy's father. This is a 1984 movie called The Mask of Death, and Ann Baxter starred as Irene Adler opposite Peter Cushing. Holmes meets Adler uh, when he's investigating a supposed kidnapping. Irene, in this, in this movie, Irene Adler is neither an adversary nor a romantic figure, so there's not a lot of electricity here. This is uh, the BBC version, the Granada series, 1984. This is Gail Honeycutt, and she played Irene Adler with grace and distinction, which is quite the opposite of some of the other interpretations that we've gotten over the years. She's very clever, she's intelligent, she is more than a match for Sherlock Holmes. She's beautiful, but perhaps it's, it's her mind as well as her beauty that Sherlock Holmes uh, is so taken with in A Scandal in Bohemia. Gil Honeycutt plays Irene Adler as the Doyle version has it written. She's a former opera singer. She's rich, she's smart, she's attractive. Um, she's, she's getting the attention of the king. She doesn't exchange with criminals as other versions would have her do. The portrayal is simple and understated, unlike most of the other versions. She's simply a smart woman, and that's it. She seems to be around Jeremy Brett's age at the time of this filming, but they don't really have an opportunity to interact much during the episode, which is really kind of a, kind of a shame. This is Sherlock Holmes and the Leading Lady. This was in 1992. This is Morgan Fairchild playing Irene Adler, opposite Christopher Lee as Holmes. This soap opera star, Morgan Fairchild, played Adler, whose romance with Holmes leads her to propose marriage to him. The realism of which is not helped by the fact that uh, Christopher Lee is 68 at the time this movie was made, and uh, Morgan Fairchild is 31. This is uh, a movie, it's a, it's a hallmark made for TV movie called A Royal Scandal in 2001, and Irene Adler is played by Liliana Komorowska. This is rather a muddle affair, and it's summed up perfectly in the scene where Adler holds Holmes at gunpoint. Holmes is Matt Ferrer, by the way. Holmes, uh, she holds him at gunpoint only to seduce him a few minutes later. Seems like sometimes Hollywood just can't help themselves, you know, they've got to put it in there. Okay, this is Rachel McAdams. I'm sure a lot of people are going to recognize this. She played Irene Adler in the 2009 movie version, Sherlock Holmes, with Robert Downey Jr. She is a professional thief, and the events of the movie take place sometime after a scandal in Bohemia because Holmes already has the photograph of her. She is apparently killed off in A Game of Shadows, which is the 2011 sequel, in order for Holmes to actually show some emotion for once in the movie. She's not an opera singer, <coughs> excuse me, in this version, and she seems more commonplace than graceful. In this film, she's a skilled professional thief as well as a divorcee. It's known that she knew Holmes prior to the events of the film. In this aspect, the film considerably departs from Doyle's original version, where Holmes never met Adler again, after the one and only time where she outwitted him and greatly impressed him. The film conversely implies that the two of them met many times and later had an intermittent, hotly consummated love affair. She and Holmes are depicted as having a deep and mutual infatuation with each other, even while she's employed by Professor Moriarty. This is from the BBC version, Sherlock, dated 2012. Many of you probably recognize this also. This is Laura Pulver. And I'm not sure if this is the most notorious version of Irene, but it's certainly up there. She is a dominatrix and attempts to confuse the highly intellectual Sherlock Holmes with her naked body. While many consider this a great episode, including myself, I have to admit it, it was also heavily criticized at the time by many Sherlockians. Holmes seeks to recover scandalous photos of a liaison between Irene Adler and a female member of the royal family. Now, the interesting thing about this, this storyline is based on fact, and it, it dates back to 1971, not that long ago, 1971. There was a British mystery, and if, if you want to look it up, it's the Lloyds Bank safe deposit box robbery, and there were pictures that, that were uh, of a high-ranking member of the royal family in a very um, comp comp compromising position. This is the CBS version, Elementary. This Irene Adler is played by Natalie Dormer, who's really Moriarty in disguise. This, this whole storyline is just kind of like way out there. 
She's eccentric, but is probably the most arrogant Irene Adler out of all of them. She's an artist. She's a criminal mastermind, using male agents to stand in as Mor Moriarty while she plots behind the scenes as the real thing. She probably wouldn't be caught dead in an opera house. Who is Irene Adler, really? This woman is crafty and intelligent, capturing the attention of Sherlock Holmes. To him, she is known as the woman, a designation of honor and allure. However, her place of distinction is often tarnished in other productions as she's portrayed as a silly thief or a dominatrix. All the versions of Irene Adler are different, but I really dislike the belittling nature in which Irene Adler is portrayed sometimes. She can't just be a smart woman who has the wit to out, outthink Sherlock Holmes. No, she has to be a dominatrix or an over-the-top criminal mastermind. As Carol Nelson Douglas commented, that's really disappointing. Hopefully future versions will consider Irene Adler a compliment to Sherlock Holmes and worthy of the title, The Woman. On the plus side, the 21st century Irene Adlers are action-oriented, and I love that. But in several key ways, they actually seem more old-fashioned than Doyle's original version. Why is Doyle's Irene Adler so much better than the versions crafted by Stephen Moffat and Guy Ritchie? Irene Adler is exceptional to many audiences because she was exceptional to Holmes himself. He refers to her as the woman because to Holmes, who is described as chivalrous and a misogynist, she transcended and eclipsed the rest of her sex. It's no wonder that her character tends to be included in any modern Sherlock Holmes franchise. She's appeared in Guy Ritchie's Sherlock Holmes films, and she's turned up in episodes of the Sherlock BBC TV series entitled A Scandal in Belgravia. Modern creators translate this exceptionalism into something more sensational and action-packed than Doyle ever wrote. But in most modern stories, Irene Adler's character is more old-fashioned than in Doyle's day. What's the first tip-off scene? In both modern versions, when she takes off her clothes in front of Sherlock Holmes to rattle him into making a mistake. This is very much in the feminine wiles vein, which looks great on camera, but doesn't really make too much sense. The original Irene Adler was far more progressive, far more canny. She knew the best way to throw Sherlock Holmes off his game, and it was not sex. A Scandal in Bohemia outlines the strong points of Irene Adler that, uh, that she possesses as a character. She's not the great detective Sherlock Holmes is, but she's able to assess the situation critically, notice what's fishy about it, and act quickly. Throughout the story, she's really in command of the situation. She's initiating the threat to the king, finding a man she loves better, marrying him, heading out of the country when she wants to break off the game with Holmes and his royal client. The story also shows how Irene and Sherlock have an intellectual kinship. They both unmask a fraud, the king, who at first shows up uh, to Sherlock Holmes in disguise. They both know a setup when they see it, and they both have a flair for dramatic disguises. What's more, the story exposes Holmes' weakness as a detective. He tends to assume the worst of people. This is also shown in his greatest failure, the adventure of the yellow face, where he gets the solution to the case entirely wrong because he didn't feel a figure on dealing with honorable people. And that's the big twist in the Irene Adler case. She's a completely honorable person. Even the king who has every reason to fear her has complete faith in her and in her decent nature once she's promised him that she won't interfere with his life. And according to Carol Nelson Douglas, this is what launches Doyle's story well ahead of its time. Doyle does not imply low, low character, criminal tendencies, or inferior intellect. But she's clever, unconventional, take charge, a seductive woman, and that's unreservably a good thing. Not so in the modern day Sherlock's. In both media series, Irene Adler is not simply an admirable person with a taste for sleuthery or adventure. In the movie series, she's both a woman who marries rich men for a living, and she's also a thief, though why you would need both professions at the same time isn't, isn't really clear. In the BBC TV series, she's a dominatrix who dabbles in blackmail and international terrorism on the side of the terrorist. Get that. The Irene character from the BBC series and from the movies 
lean very heavily on their sexuality and their criminality. Both characters aim their sex squarely at the hero to their inevitable cost. And both modern Irene Adlers have an even bigger strike against them. While the original Adler was independent, they're both pawns of Moriarty. The movie Adler is sort of a cross between a messenger girl and, a, and sexual bait for Sherlock Holmes. Letting them throw a punch or carry a whip doesn't update the archetype. It takes something stronger. But why bother with that when Irene Adler can get naked on camera, bat her eyelashes at Sherlock, and, and get rescued? So we can welcome the 21st century film versions, which almost always include Irene Adler. Yet Doyle's 1888 creation is far more liberated than the Irene Adler of modern male writers and directors. Gone is the supposition that Holmes never would consummate anything more than a case. So Irene Adler becomes the nearest romantic object, always, always sexy, always in need of rescuing in the end. So in my opinion, the 1984, strictly my opinion, the 1984 Jeremy Brett Gale Honeycutt PBS version of Scandal in Bohemia, that's really the gold standard for Irene Adler's for me. She's both classy and clever, but nonetheless, please pick your own favorite, but I hope you get to enjoy them all. And I hope I didn't put you to sleep. <laughs> I've heard Irene pronounced several different ways. Uh, how, uh, how, do you, uh, how, uh, how did you resolve that? I did. I'm from the Midwest, so it was always Irene. I, I haven't resolved it. I'm from the Midwest. It's always been Irene to me, because that's what it looks like. That's how it's spelled. But you know, yeah, I've heard Irene plenty of times. And I, I don't know. Dean, what do you think? You are certainly uh, an expert of, of, along these lines. Oh. Yeah, I, I don't know. Well, how did PBS pronounce it? Uh, I believe it was Irene. I, I don't think I've heard I'm sorry, BBC, how did they? Uh, 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 BBC, it was Irene also. There you go. Next is on the agenda is Tim Klein. And we, Tim has been a member of our society for over 20 years. And one of the biggest things that Tim does, if, if you enjoy Sherlock Holmes games or puzzles or Anything to do with games themselves, Tim has one of the largest Sherlock Holmes collection of games in, in, in the country. So if you're interested in any of those, uh, feel free to ask him a question. So with that, I will turn it over to Tim. Good evening. Uh, if you'll bear with me so I can put my eyes on. My reading eyes. So thank you all for coming tonight. As Steve said, my name is Tim Klein, and I've been a member for quite a while. Uh, I'm going to talk to you tonight, hopefully discuss with you, the female versions of Sherlock Holmes. So Sherlock is the most one of the most beloved characters of the last 100 years. The love of Sherlock Holmes is no mystery at all, and I consider Holmes a superhero, even though he doesn't fly uh, or wear tights or a cape. He is an intellectual superhero who saves the day, makes things right, and protects the people who may occasionally, oh, um, who may occasionally wear a cape depending on the weather. He has been billed as the original Cape Crusader. So, could we really have a female version of Sherlock Holmes to live up to these ideals? Let us look at his qualities and see if we can find some female versions of Sherlock Holmes. He is smart sees what other people miss, and is discerning and wise. When we watch or read Sherlock Holmes stories, part of us enjoy the adventures he takes us on, and part of us, admit it now, part of us, you want to be just like him. So, you would love for your little girl to be the next Sherlock Holmes, or are you looking for a new career for yourself, ladies? So, to coin a, a term, an example of a girl lock or a herlock Holmes. Irene Adler, who bested Sherlock Holmes in the story A Scandal in Bohemia, has been elevated uh, to be as smart and resolute as Sherlock Holmes. Our own society member uh, and world-famous author, Carol Nelson Douglas, uh, has written about the detective Irene Adler for many years now, and 
as you heard, was just discussed by Cindy Brown. As a detective, Irene is every bit as good as Sherlock. And that was her first book right there that she did. Um, so that brings us to a girl who loves Holmes so much and wants to be like him that she marries him. And, of course, that's Mary Russell, created by Laurie R. King. We read in the Beekeeper's Apprentice where Holmes is keeping bees in retirement. In Wonders, in Wonders this girl who is longing to be loved uh, and find her path in life. She is young, gawky, egotistical, recently orphaned, with an intellect to impress Sherlock Holmes and match him wit for wit. In more than 14 works, Russell has become not just Sherlock's wife, but almost a clone of his knowledge of crime and criminal detection methods. Now that we have found two women to look at as the female version of Sherlock Holmes to model your new career after, we will look at the younger versions for our daughters to aspire to master detective status. My Name is Paris is the first series I discovered with a girl wanting to be Sherlock Holmes. It is 1900 where a girl from Chicago goes to Paris to visit an uncle who turns up dead under mysterious circumstances. She takes it upon herself to solve the murder and Paris continues her detective work in a total of six novels by Elizabeth Howard. Our next heroine is Enola Holmes, who turns out to be the 14-year-old sister of the already famous Sherlock Holmes, 20 years her senior. This great series brings characters and settings from the original canon of Sherlock Holmes in a total of six books in all. These stories are some of the best at showing where a young girl can accomplish with mentors such as Mycroft and Sherlock as brothers, but also as very independent. She devises a scheme as two persons, where to the poor, she's the mute sister, and to the rich, Ivy, the secretary to a private investigator. Within the series, Enola spends much of her time dodging Sherlock and Mycroft, only to be united in the end with her famous siblings. We switch now to 1930s England and 19-year-old Portia Adams. Portia is a budding detective with a mysterious heritage living in Toronto. Portia is suddenly uprooted at the beginning of the series, taken to London where she has inherited 221B Baker Street, the most famous address of the master detective, and must start solving crimes involving stolen jewelry, a sick judge, and a kidnapping. Her greatest mystery turns out to be her own, which is why did she inherit 221 and why did her mother keep her heritage a secret. Our next candidate for a female version of Sherlock Holmes would be Charlotte Holmes. The great, great, great granddaughter of Sherlock Holmes, a study in Charlotte connects with her Dr. Watson's, with Dr. Watson's great, great, great grandson, James, in which he has a short fuse and is a candidate for murder. Moriarty's descendants even show up for a teenage plot that involves poison, explosions, and a deadly virus. The novel presents a dark view of boarding school with some drinking and other risque behavior. So, let's move on to some duos. Next with Raleigh and Cicely being invited to attend the mysterious Sherlock Academy of Fine Sleuths, where children learn the art of detection, just like Sherlock Holmes. They discover a strange burglary of a 100-year-old painting has been committed and the game is afoot. The Sherlock Academy has three books in its series. Sisters of, or excuse me, the Stoker and Holmes series is the next duo which consists of Evelyn Stoker and Mina Holmes, the sister of Bram Stoker and the niece of Sherlock Holmes, which vampire hunting and mysterious solving are in their blood. The setting is an alternate Victorian steampunk London where Mina and Evelyn have been recruited by Irene Adler to solve mysteries afflicting young women of the city. Mina is gifted with a Homocenian mind and has been trained by her uncle in the art of observation and detection. In every generation of Eveline's family, one person has been born with extraordinary strength 
and speed, destined to fight and kill vampires. As they encounter real danger in the form of an Egyptian cult, vampires, and a tall Scottish gentleman named Ambrose Grayling, who matches Mina deduction for deduction, that irritates her to no end, when he isn't making her stomach flutter. Mina and Evelyn must learn how to balance working with each other in order to stay alive and save uh, each other. The second book in this series features mediums carousing with spirits and spiritual manifestations, while the third book is the Chess Queen Enigma and involves a princess that is a chess queen that will heal the centuries-old rift between England and the Betrovians. Our last duo is Zena and Xander Holmes, an American brother and sister living in London for a year, discover that Sherlock Holmes is their great-great-great-grandfather when they are inducted into the preservation of famous detective, uh, detectives and given his unsolved case book from which they attempt to solve the case of a famous missing painting. Two more novels follow with The Beast of Backslope and The Case That Time Forgot. Elementary, she read, a Sherlock Holmes bookshop, bookshop mystery finds Gemma Doyle, a transplanted Englishwoman, retiring to West London to manage her great uncle's Sherlock Holmes bookshop and emporium. Located at 221 or 222 Baker Street, specializing in the Holmes canon and pastiches, it also has a cat named Moriarty. Gemma finds a rare and potentially valuable magazine containing the first Sherlock Holmes story hidden in the bookshop. She and her friend Jane set off to find the owner only to stumble upon a dead body. And Mrs. Sherlock Holmes is the true life story of Mrs. Grace Humston, the New York lawyer and detective who solved the famous cold case of Ruth Kruger, an 18-year-old girl who disappeared in 1917. Grace was an amazing lawyer and traveling detective during a time when no women were practicing these professions. She focused on solving cases no one else wanted and advocating the innocence. Grace became the first female U.S. district attorney and made groundbreaking investigations into modern slavery. It is too bad that Elizabeth Hardy in the movie Young Sherlock Holmes did not become Mrs. Sherlock Holmes, or we might actually have a female detective named Shirley Holmes that could solve crimes just like dear old dad. My final candidate is an artist named Jessica Lissette, which sings that Sherlock, as being her perfect mate, they could marry and have crime-solving children that would carry on the great legacy of the greatest detective to ever live. Thank you. Do you have a list of all of those books? Um, yeah, I could actually get you uh, one. If I you would love that. They sure. sound adorable. Thank you. You're welcome. A lot of them are, are kids or geared towards, um, you know, teen readers. Can you tell me the background on that book, The Study in Charlotte? Because I think that sounded interesting uh, the, a study in Charlotte is uh, very similar to the others you would probably find it in the um, teen books uh, book section of any bookstore let me find it again here real quick um, where was that a second. yep so she is the great 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 granddaughter of Sherlock Holmes according to the story um, she connects with Dr. Watson's great-great-grandson, James. Um, and so the, um, they're, they go, they're living in London, and as the story progresses, um, he's actually accused of murder. So she basically has to um, keep him from going to jail for the murder. Um, the problem is, is Moriarty's descendants also show up as well. And so they, you know, they exacerbate the plot as well. Um, so, but it is, it's, it is geared towards uh, teens or junior novel in that respect. Does that kind of answer what you were looking for? So, the, the final discussion, like I said, mine will, fell to, how did Sherlock Holmes feel about women himself? And that has been a question that has been on everybody's minds. 
ever since uh, Dr. Watson and Dr. Doyle uh, penned the uh, stories over 100 years ago. And so I'm going to start with the very simple question, did Sherlock Holmes actually hate women? And the answer to me is very simple, absolutely not. He did not hate women, no matter how many people will tell you that. But I'm going to try to prove to you that he actually cared about women a lot more than people feel like that he did. And I'm going to stick with the old story uh, or the old uh, premise that actions speak louder than words do in many cases. So let's look at the first quote that Sherlock Holmes says, and this is actually from one of the first books, where he says, women are never to be entirely trusted, not the best of them. Oh, okay, wait, that's not a great starting point for my, uh, my premise, obviously. Um, but he did say that at the beginning of the book, unfortunately. But later on in the book... Uh, you can see where he is talking about Mary Morstan, who turns out to be Dr. Watson's future wife. And as they work through the, the mystery of the sign of four, he says, I think she is one of the most charming young ladies I've ever met and might have been most useful in such work as we have been doing. So basically he says she would make a great detective herself. She has a decided genius that way. Well, that's a pretty nice compliment to give to somebody, and, and I go back to exactly what Lise was saying, that, that women were considered, I'm not going to say second-class citizens, but kind of low uh, on the totem pole on some things. And so for, for Sherlock Holmes to basically say, I think she would be the equal of all of us, to me, is a pretty high compliment for her. So let's look at some other examples throughout the stories themselves that may give us some idea of, of where Sherlock Holmes felt. Now, the next one is in a case of identity, and if you're not familiar with this, there was a, for, a poor, unfortunate woman, uh, Mary Sutherland, uh, whose stepfather decided that he did not want her getting married off and, and you know, having to use her uh, inheritance from her real father. So he decides to impersonate another person and date her to keep her from hooking up with a, with a true love. And so in this, as you can see, Dr. Watson actually says Sherlock Holmes welcomed her with the easy courtesy for which he was remarkable. And several times through the story, he tries to make sure that, that she is comfortable and at, at ease. And at the end of the story, um, the gentleman, the, the stepfather, Mr. Windebank, if you've read it, you know that Sherlock Holmes actually threatened to beat him to an inch of his life for what he had done to her. And so again, to me, that kind of gives an action that, the, that he was standing up for, for a woman in, in this story. The next one is the twisted lip, and this is a one where uh, Mr. St. Clair had decided that he could make more money panhandling on the street than actually being a newspaper reporter, and his wife, of course, gets very concerned because he disappears and, and can't find him and everything. And in this one, you can see where Holmes says, I have seen too much not to uh, know that the impression of a woman made me more valuable than the conclusion of an analytical reasoner. Again, giving her a pretty high compliment that, that he feels like that she can solve a lot of things that, that he would not be able to. And at the end, when he's talking to Mr. St. Clair, he says, you would have done better to have trusted your wife, you know, because uh, she had already explained to him what she thought of his actions itself. And then we move on to the red circle, and this is one where uh, one of Mrs. Hudson's friends, Mrs. Warren, who is also a landlady, um, comes to Sherlock Holmes and is concerned about one of her boarders that she just never sees or anything else. And, and she almost breaks down because she is so upset with what's going on in her own household. And as you can see here, uh, the way that Dr. Watson explains it, I think, is, is wonderful in saying that Holmes leaned forward and laid his long, thin fingers upon the woman's shoulder. He had an almost hypnotic power of soothing when he wished. The scared look faded from her eyes, and her agitated features smoothed into their usual commonplace. She sat down in the chair which he had indicated. This does not sound to me as somebody that hates women at all. This sounds like somebody that has compassion for them and sincerely wants to help women out. So let's look at some of the clients themselves that he had. Now, understand that in the 60 stories that Dr. Watson and, and Dr. Doyle wrote, about half of them involve women in, as, in terms of being the clients themselves. But what you will find as you read through them is that the, the, the half that are men as clients tend to come from the upper class and have money. 
as if you look at the women, they tended to be more toward the lower middle class and didn't have a lot of money. And so to me, that appears that Holmes was w willing to take on these cases, even though there might not be a financial incentive to it, just because he felt like this was an important thing to do to, to help these women. The other thing is, if you notice when he go through the stories, several of the stories where women were involved, Holmes would waive their fee or just say, don't worry about it. I, you know, we won't even worry about a fee. He didn't do that a whole lot with the men. The men, if they had money, that he made sure that, that he got paid for it. So that's an important thing, too. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is, so why was Sherlock Holmes so distant from the women uh, that, that everybody thought he should be involved with, whether it was Irene Adler or some of the other women? I have three theories for you. The first one is one that I've had for many years that, I, that I've argued myself is that the stories that Dr. Watson and Dr. Doyle wrote, there were 60 of them. So we got to see 60 tales. Now, in those stories, if you've read them, you also know that Watson points out that there's about 111 unpublished cases that he was personally involved in and, and things. So that gives us about 170 stories. But what's more important is that at one point, Holmes points out that he has solved over 1,000 cases and that over 500 of them were considered capital cases, which might involve murder or some other heinous crime. Now, if you extrapolate that out at the time that he said he had solved over 1,000 cases, most Sherlockian experts argue that he's probably solved over 1,500, maybe even as many as 1,600 cases through his 30-year career. We only got a snapshot of 60 of those stories. You also, if you, if you read into what uh, different scholars have written, each one of the stories only averaged about three days in length. Some of them shorter, some of them longer, but the average for all 60 stories was three days. And in those three days, many times, we only saw a snapshot again of an hour or two of, of Sherlock Holmes. So my theory is that if you take all that together, out of his 30 years and out of the 1,600 cases, we only see a very small part of, of Sherlock Holmes. And, and not only, most of it was in his professional life, we saw very little of his personal life. So when people have this discussion of, well, did he like women or not, I think it's a little unfair because we don't know, because we didn't know that much about his life itself. The second thing is, Sherlock Holmes made it very clear over and over and over again that his whole passion was within logic and deduction. And to him, having a romantic affair would just totally ruin that. That he just did not believe that he could be the best detective he could be if he was wrapped up in a romantic affair. So I think he constantly tried to make sure that he separated himself from this. Uh, and as you can see here, Love is an emotional thing, you know, a lot on down. The emotional qualities are antagonistic to a clear reasoning. It is of the first importance not to allow your judgment to be biased by personal qualities. So over and over again, like I said, he made it very clear to Dr. Watson that he did not want to get into a, a romantic uh, affair because of that. Now, the third theory, and I think this is actually one of the better ones, and this actually came from Susan Rice, who is one of the uh, very, very well-known Sherlockian experts nationally and internationally. And, and I found this in an article she wrote many, many years ago. What she pointed out was that something I don't think very many of us ever think about. Who did Sherlock Holmes go after? Some of the worst people in London. Moriarty, Moran, on down the list. And in her mind, she said, why would he tie himself to a woman or a romantic interest knowing there was a good chance that the criminals that he was going after might go after her and use her to get back to him, you know, either kill her or take her as a hostage or, you know, whatever it was. And especially if they had had kids, they could, they, these uh, criminals could have even used them in a worse case. So her theory was that Holmes chose very early in life that he would not have romantic interests, so that way he did not have to worry about his family being exposed to it. And obviously he didn't have to worry about that with Mycroft because he was part of the government and had protection that most of us probably never even heard about the, the, the protections that Mycroft had. All right, so one final observation. This is another thing that if you read through the 60 stories, what you see is 
if there was a male client, many, many times Sherlock Holmes questioned the veracity of what they were telling him. Uh, several times he actually sent the male client off and said, I think you're lying to me or I don't have time to mess with you. And so then they would have to kind of come back and, you know, and, and basically beg him or get down on one knee and, you know, and, and ask him to reconsider his judgment. He never did that with women, if you notice. He always listened to them. He would ask them questions. But more importantly, a lot of the times the female clients, he believed what they said up front. He didn't question it. He, you know, he, he accepted their sincerity up front. Again, I don't see that as the quality of a, somebody that, that did not like women themselves. So bottom line to me is that Sherlock Holmes, while he was not willing to give his heart to any women whatsoever, I think he gave his entire brain and his uh, ability to solve cases to all the women that he, that he worked with through the 60 cases, the 111 unpublished cases, and the 1,600 cases that we never heard about. So I think he was very much on the side of women throughout the entire, his entire career. Thank you very much. I have a comment and a question. Uh, I've been a member of Sherlock and Society since 1974 and have literally attended meetings around the world. And there was a lot of information given out here tonight that I was not aware of. It was really excellent talks. I, I commend all our speakers. Uh, second, a question. You had a quote there from a uh, case of identity referring to Sherlock's easy courtesy. Doesn't that uh, condemn the modern interpretations of Sherlock by Robert Downey and Jeremy Brett and Johnny Lou Miller, who are often very, very rude in social situations which it doesn't call for, and confirm the perfect interpretation by Basil Rathbone? I'm, I'm going to go back to the, the theory that the modern interpretations of Sherlock Holmes tend to be more leading toward action-packed and you know the, the the main character of Sherlock Holmes being uh, whatever you want to call it more uh, action oriented and also more of a bad boy type personality I mean I, I get a kick out of the Robert Downey Jr. movies of of how messy he is but yet when you read the original stories Watson makes it very clear that he wasn't messy you know that that he actually was pretty fastidious in his dress and everything else so so I think people stretch it this time. But I also am a big believer that I think if you went back and looked, I think Sherlock Holmes in the 1880s and 1890s was probably one of the perfect gentlemen of, of that time period. That while he treated people with respect when they needed it, uh, and, and, I, and I'm going to use a, something that my father taught me many, many years ago, and that is that you know, we're always told that people have to earn our respect. My father was the exact opposite. He said, you should respect every person until they prove to you that you shouldn't respect them. I think that's the way Sherlock Holmes was. I think he respected everybody until they proved him differently. And, and I think, especially with the women, he respected them and, and again, like I said, believed in what they were saying uh, and, unless they proved him otherwise. 